Okay, we're recording. So, anyways, the, just the place to start is to state your name and a uh, Christian name is Rudolph Schwartz, but everybody refers to me as Rudy. And I guess let's start at the beginning. Where do you, if you can give us some history of where you grew up and you know your pre pre military life. Okay, uh, Brooklyn, New York, the home of the Dodgers in those days, who won a number of pennants. Uh, a local product all the way through City College of New York, master's degree at NYU. Uh, then comes 1951. The Korean War. The draft boards are breathing down on next. And the question was, well, if the country demands that I go into the army, if I die in Korea, that's what the fate is. But my friends and I uh, examined every option that we could, and then we found out in 1952. If you join the U.S. Naval Reserve with a provision that if you pass the test, you would go to office candidate school in the Navy in Newport, Rhode Island. So three of us applied. All three of us passed the test. Uh, I passed the test easily, but there was a question about whether my teeth met their specifications. So the senior dentist overruled the junior dentist and allowed me to participate in that program. So, in 1952, we went to Newport, Rhode Island. Halfway through the program, there was a question, what, what, did the Navy think I would make a good naval officer? Did I think I would make a good naval officer? And I decided that this gunnery work and navigation work was really not my forte. Now, the option that you had was if you served as an officer, you had a four-year obligation. If you served as an enlisted man, you had a two-year obligation. So that was one thing that argued for the latter. So what essentially happened was that halfway through, uh, they asked me if I wanted to continue, and I said no. So at that point, if I had gone a week or two more, I would not have to going to boot camp, but I was short one to me, so I went down to Bainbridge, Maryland, and had to go walk to boot camp. And then... And you already had your college degree yeah, and your master's degree. Yeah, well, I actually had, I had not completed a paper to get a master's degree in public administration. Subsequently, I got a master's degree in education, and a doctorate in education, but that was after the fact. But in, in effect, I had a bachelor's degree at all but the final paper for a master's degree in public administration. So you went down to boot camp? Went down to boot camp, finished boot camp, and then was assigned to the Franklin Delano Rose, otherwise referred to CBA 42. The Roosevelt I learned after doing a lot of research for this, which I didn't realize at the time, it was a very important ship. It was conceived in 1942. It was launched at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in 1945. What I didn't learn until yesterday, to be honest about it, was it was originally named the Carl C. The President Truman ordered that it be renamed the Roosevelt Honorable Franklin D. Wilson. And the picture I just gave you shows Harry Truman, the two fleet admirals aboard the Rosa in 46. Uh, I came on it, of course, in the end of 52, beginning of 53. Where was it stationed when uh, you were Well, at Newport, uh, Rhode Island. And interestingly enough, a friend of mine who was in the class after me, but went through and became an able officer. When I came aboard, lo and behold, I saluted, and this was his friend of mine. And 
thing I can't really do about my story that I, I completed the program and sort of convinced it me to, to say, you got the better deal than I did. <laughs> now the interesting thing is, and, and this is why when I originally uh, came called about this program, I said that I didn't do anything which was extraordinary. I didn't know if you wanted to hear my story, but you just said, maybe. When I came aboard the ship, they weren't quite sure what to do with me because the full complement of clerical administration was taken. So what happened was, here's a Jewish boy who became the chaplain to the Catholic and Protestant chaplains aboard the Roosevelt. And we had perhaps a handful of Jewish boys at all. And as an additional duty, I became the ship's librarian. And this is a whole story about what I did about this little And I've been loath to tell my story because, you know, friends of mine serve sort of combat and everything. But I come to the realization that it was the luck of the draw that I didn't go to Korea, and I wasn't in the Army, but I happened to go to the Navy, was willing to do anything that the Navy wanted me to do, and wound up to the ship's librarian and the chaplain, which I guess in and of itself was interesting. For example, in the first few months, one of the uh, lieutenant commander, squadron commander, who I became very fond of, who chatted a lot about the books, borrowed a book one day, and the next day he was gone. He was lost in the training exercise, and that really affected me very much to think that this person that I had, who probably served in World War II, I never found it out, but she was a lieutenant commander, I guess he was really a neighbor. Uh, the other important they might have been, you know, rumors float around continuously in the body shape. Understand the juxtaposition, the Korean War was winding down. Here we were on this Mediterranean cruise, and the scuttlebutt aboard the ship was that we were going to go through the Suez Canal and go to Korea. And wow, but as it turned out, that would never have materialized because the draft of the ship was too wide to have sure. gone through the Suez Canal. And as I read yesterday, just replenishing my thoughts, what also happened, we were supposed to uh, dock someplace uh, in Turkey, but there was a water problem. So they had to rescind that possibility. And so actually we went back home on the schedule. That was a six month cruise. And when, it, when we came back, the ship was going to be decommissioned in Puget Sound, Washington, because they had to adjust the jets. The Roosevelt was one of the first uh, aircraft carriers that had jets. They were not attuned to the time. And the situation was that it would go around South America, and that would have been a great crew. But it said that you have to have more than three months to make it. I did So I didn't make that. And then I eventually went to Quonset Point, Rhode Island, and then was discharged back in Brooklyn. So it sounds like you're, you sailed to the Mediterranean. Yeah. Sailed around the Mediterranean for a while. Yes. And, and came back. Yeah. What, uh, what? Yes. That was a six month cruise. And that was the last cruise before it was reconstructed in the Puget Sound. Ultimately, it went on. It was finally decommissioned and sold for scrap in 1977. But one other interesting thing on that cruise is we landed in Beirut, which was a different world. That was the second Paris at that time. It was the, the citadel of, of fast movers of that day. And then, uh, while there, they offered a little tour to Damascus, Syria. So I spent a few hours in Damascus, Syria. Uh, Did you get to Israel? Not on that cruise. Oh, not Subsequently, true. seven times because my son's a rabbi. <laughs> not on that cruise. So as as the the ship's chaplain, 
what, what did you do? Well, the chaplain's assistant. Okay. There was, there was an ace. Well, that's interesting. Uh, I had to help set up for the masses. What did I know about the masses? I didn't know about But I learned on the job training. The interesting thing is the senior chaplain was the Catholic chaplain. Now, in all honesty, I would have to say he was a very important postdoc. The Protestant chaplain was a different breed of human being. Those two fellows did not get along. Uh, that's putting it mildly. So I had to be there sometimes in the dialogue between the Did you get along with the Yeah, people? I got along with her. I preferred the Protestant chaplain. But he was a much nicer person. Uh, and then we had a contingent of Marines uh, aboard the ship who participated in the world of events. Oh, I might add, guess how many people served on that ship at one time? Maybe guess. 1,500? Close to 4,000. I wow. originally told my wife a lesson about the world, and I reviewed my notes for today. A complement of about 32 to 3,300 men maybe 400 authors there, bringing it up close to 4,000. What I read yesterday, you know, it's an enormous ship. The height of it was the height of the Chrysler Building in New York City. And uh, I never got to, quite frankly, because I only served close to here, I never got to see most of the ship. And one day, I brought my wife, we weren't, we weren't married yet, but I brought my wife on the ship, and I brought it, a place that I said, I think this is how I get here. <laughs> I was sort of embarrassed that I really didn't know my way around the ship. I never went underneath the ship. So what was your, where was your area on the ship? Uh, uh, well, we had uh, administrative offices uh, for all the clerical the personnel were. Were they in the tower? Uh, not in the tower, below the tower, on the main deck, uh, a little close to the main deck. Oh, the other thing was, uh, now that I think of it, what was difficult for me in that very sense of the years, uh, we didn't hear about the warning of the jets on the deck. I, I think to this day I have a little hearing problem due to the loud noises on the deck. You couldn't avoid it. So I feel sorry for the people who actually were on the flat deck because uh, they were subjected all the time, and I forgot if they had here, but uh, here it was. They probably did. Probably did. They probably did. So while you were, uh, I guess you're on maneuvers, are, are they flying every day? Uh, not every day. Uh, strategically, they were on maneuvers. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we, very, sometimes we would call to the flight deck to watch the You know, the idea was that the ship was there as part of the Sixth Fleet in case there were any emergencies that arose. As I say, the juxtaposition of the winding down of the Korean War and where we were, the idea was that it was conceivable that the ship might be deployed from Europe to Korea. So when the Korean War ended, were you still in the Navy or? Uh, yeah, right the Korea, I, I just reviewed my notes the other day. The, the war never ended. There was an armistice in 53, which I think still stands in today. It does. And that was the summer of 53. We were still on our cruise, and that was the reason why the port was that we might go to Korea. But then that, that was abandoned, and then we came. Matter of fact, I think we came home a bit earlier, but uh, they, the amount of time you had to serve was reduced by two months because they didn't need as many personnel. Right. I guess that's the war wild down. So, were you hoping to go to Korea? No. Uh, uh, you mean hoping? You know, some, while I was in the Navy. Right. No, I was perfectly happy to enjoy the Renaissance in Europe. <laughs> I mean, you know, well, let's be honest. You're patriotic to 
the extent that you want to do and serve honorably in whatever facet you want. But given the choice between being in Korea and being in the Mediterranean, that was a no-brainer for me to be in the Mediterranean. And we sought the several courts. Uh, I might, from a sociological point of view, I might point out the reason I brought this picture is there were very, very few blacks or Hispanics aboard the ship in those days. And I cultivated the friendship of this young man, I forgot his name and everything, even brought him to a synagogue in Gibraltar, which was a mistake because uh, the uh, Torah was in French and Hebrew, <laughs> and I don't speak French. So I brought him with me, and I wonder what he thought when he saw me totally confused. And uh, on another trip, uh, we, we did take several trips. We, uh, one notable trip was uh, Athens, uh, Pyrenees. Uh, and then I went eventually up to Salonika, the northern part of Greece, which was very interesting. We went to the French Riviera. Uh, we, uh, we went to the eastern coast of Italy, Bari, which is not the part of Italy that uh, most tourists go to the western part. So that was very pleasant, and they, they made it their business to walk on these uh, trips. So, See, it's a non-combatant sort of situation. That's why when you interview, whoever did the interview, Joe died in World War II, a very good friend of mine, you know, he went through hell. Through the luck of the draw, I didn't. And, and that's why I was reluctant to come originally, because I thought the honor should go to the World War II veterans who were in combat. But I guess I played my own. Everybody's got their own story, and you've, you've got it exactly right. It's the luck of the draw, um, and I think that's one of the things we're finding out too. Yeah, is that you know, some people um, um, the guy we interviewed last week, mm -hmm. his name I don't remember. I mean, he he was yes, he was uh, assigned to a ship that uh, took forever just to get commissioned. And by the time he was commissioned, it had sailed to Europe and the war ended. Yeah. So they sent him to Japan, but by the right. time they got to Japan, that war ended. So. Now, for example, if the senior dentist had not certified me, and therefore I would have been rejected from the uh, program, I would have probably wound up in the army could have very well have wound up in Korea and be on the memorial in Atlantic City for the Korean veterans. So, so what, when you came home, what did you do? I married her. <laughs> Yesterday we celebrated our 59th anniversary. I, uh, my parents were immigrants from Europe. Neither one of them went beyond the sixth grade. My mother was barely living. Wonderful woman, very intelligent woman. They were always wanted me to be a teacher so I could have the security. Where were they from? Uh, Poland, the old Austrian Hungarian Empire prior to World War I, which was Poland. Well, eventually uh, I went on and I got my master's in education. I got my doctorate in education from NYU. I taught on the high school level and I was an adjunct professor. Catholic College, right next to the military academy, was a point, which was very interesting because this was the first group of blue collar workers' daughters who had an opportunity to go to college. And one of the reasons they went there was to wind up marrying those pointers, <laughs> which did occur. Did occur. Uh, yeah, so. So how did you end up in Cherry Hill? My son was a rabbi. Uh, he wanted to open congregations, of course, you know. Uh, and we came down about, about six years ago. And uh, he ultimately got something else. And he's in northern New Jersey now. 
but we've got the military uh, uh, accessibility to Philadelphia and the better of the accessibility to uh, other all kinds of things, right. 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 city and things like that. So that's what brought us down there. So I guess my only other question would be if you have anything to, like if you were to sum up your military career. Uh, it was a very fortuitous opportunity. Look, we were breathing hard. I graduated from City College in June of 1951. I was not quite sure what do I do with myself because the inevitability of the draft was, and I forgot what number I had in the draft. So, I started with uh, this master's degree in public administration and while you all have a job working. Still worried, when, when, will I, when was I going to be drafted? When was I going to go to search? And then, fortuitously, the, the opportunity to get to the Navy, the, that option that I explained to you before. So I would say that all things considered, I'm extremely lucky. Things went my way. I, in a way, regret that I didn't complete the uh, Office of Catholic School, but then again, I realized that others would make them make more decisions. I didn't think that I was talented in that area and to have served for an additional three and a half years in that capacity. I did not think served the Navy well or so. But all told, I did what I could. Uh, it sounded I, like it was a good experience. It was a wonderful experience for many of my parents, but I had gone up and down the Mediterranean. And uh, I had some memorable experiences. Uh, so, for example, in Piraeus, when we had the report for Athens, mm -hmm. I took a little trip on my own to Salonika. Now, if I just may tell you, Salonika was one of the great Jewish citadels in Europe. It was the only city in Europe I found that that had more than 50% of its population Jewish. You no, know, very few people know that. And I went up there to just find out something about it and found out that most of the population was destroyed by the Nazis. There was one rabbi left out, eight or ten, and he was not available, he was on vacation. So it was a disappointing experience. But where else would I have had the opportunity to have made that journey? And that's when you get this history teacher, and you know, as you are uh, your graduate work, all things history means something to me. But by the way, the Nazis were particularly brutal in Greece. Yeah, but you don't hear about Yeah, you don't hear about that. The highest percentage of Jews that were killed was Holland, somewhere in the neighborhood of 95%. But my naval experience uh, was wonderful. And to follow the tradition, that other picture I gave you was so memorable. The one I just want to show you again this one. Just stop and think. Two five star admirals aboard the road with the two senior naval uh, heroes. Iconic figures aboard with President Truman to rename the Carl Sea, which, which was a midway type carrier, to rename that in honor of Roosevelt, who was a hero. I mean, I didn't even know until yesterday about this, but I was on that ship. So, you know, from a historical point of view, I may have been a little tiny cog or something, but. This is a memorable part of American history. So when was the ship decommissioned? Uh, it was finally totally decommissioned in 1977. I read the sulfur scrap. Right. So it spent time in Vietnam, I'm sure. Uh, I think. Did it go to Vietnam? That's an interesting question. I think the Sixth Fleet was in Vietnam. Yeah, it might have been. It might have been. Yeah, yeah, I lost track of that. I did go to the... Oh. This is interesting. They had, I read yesterday, 22 reunions. 
I went to one in Frederick, Maryland. But I hardly knew anybody. It's going to say hardly see nobody from either. the ship that I was uh, when I served. I mean, these were people who had served from '46 uh, on through the '70s. So it's, this definitely is part of Americana, and uh, the story I'm telling you is more about the ship than me. <laughs> All right. Well. It, it was interesting. Everybody's little piece is interesting. Right. Sure, so I hope this makes a contribution to such so I... Absolutely. I mean, my, my, I talked to my dad who was also in the Navy. I mean, he's passed away now. But I used to talk to him all the time. Um, and he never saw action either. But, you know, just you get some ideas about what it was like you know, most of the time he was bored out of his skull, um, just because... Well, you know, the, the people in the administrative department, I particularly remember a very nice red-headed fellow who's very popular and very well liked by everybody. And I had a conversation. He came from the rural part of Colorado. I mean, a small town. He told me he had to go a hundred miles to go to the movie. And I was just flabbergasted. Here's a kid from Brooklyn, urban area, in the same compound as this fellow from rural Colorado. And I got a real feel for what it was like to have lived in rural Colorado, say, during the World War II. Wouldn't have gotten that anywhere no, else. Other than no the how or nowhere could I have had that experience. He was a particularly fine person to begin with. I think one of the things that we're, we're seeing also in talking to um, all of you guys is that there's definitely a, a growing up and a change of, of life. Even if, you, even if you didn't see action, your life was never the same. I mean, Absolutely. Certainly. Absolutely. Well, for example, I had always, as I told you before, I, my parents, particularly my mother, always encouraged me find the occupation and the security and benefits of being uh, fully employed in America. And there was no question that uh, I would go on to further education and of course having the GI Bill, I got my master's and my doctorate at practically no cost. And so you asked me, uh, did I benefit by the service person? Absolutely. And, you know, I hope that veterans of today get the full benefits. Uh, but uh, by and large, the, the crew was a nice cross-section of America. It was close to 4,000 people on one ship. <laughs> I'll tell you one little thing I never told you before, because my wife probably thinks I'm talking too much. At breakfast time, one of the things they served were baked beans, which I love beyond belief. And everybody would push me ahead. I mean, here I was in the back, and then all of a sudden I'd be swept because they all knew I liked that, and I would eat it every day. And, and it most of these fellows would endure it because they just care for it. <laughs> so that's a little trivia, nothing, but it was interesting. How was the food? Good. Good. And then you could buy uh, all kinds of things on the ship. I'll tell you one thing uh, also, the mail was so cheap, but uh, postcards were, my wife sent me a postcard, which was a three cent postcard. Mm -hmm. She was a senior in college, and I have to admit to you that I helped write her term papers, political science, science, while I was aboard the ship. So she owes me something. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I used to hear stories that there was a lot of a lot of sports going on on aircraft. Yeah, yeah, we play basketball, boxing. Yeah, a lot of a lot of basketball. And uh, very often it was Marines playing the Navy. The Marines had their own private. Uh, I have actually a picture of the Marine on it on the ship. Uh, yeah. This, so this, the, this was the ship's newspaper. This. Very distinguished marine, and you get all kinds of medals. Uh, 
I was surprised uh, when I looked at that. This was a very nice publication uh, that was by uh, Elgin Gay. Over 4,000 guys. It's the size of yeah. their small college. Yeah, right. Yeah, this is a, this is a wonderful uh, publication. So, that's about it. Any questions? Anything to add? Anything to add? Um, one little short story. <laughs> When the uh, ship came into New York, we were not engaged, and, and, but we had been going with each other for a while. And when it came into New York, Rudy said, would you like to see the ship? Oh, yeah, sure. And he said, and I'm going to ask my mother to come too. So here I was, and I was going to meet his mother and go on the ship. So in those days, you got dressed with a suit, and a hat and gloves, very formal. And we get on this ship, and there were no elevators, and you had to climb these ladders all the way to get any place, and I was with high heels and a hat and gloves. <laughs> and I don't think I got very far on that ship, but I did get, yeah. uh, get to meet my future mother-in-law, and everybody approved of everybody. And here we are, 59 years later. We're all working on it. <laughs> yeah. It's great. Right. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank my you. My pleasure. So, what's the...